Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 174 for Monday, July 23rd, 2018. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the podcast by for and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire, back in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm tired. I've yeah. been playing a lot. How what? about you? You've been traveling and playing a lot. Dude, yeah, uh, yes. Um, so, right. So we had a, a trip that was part family vacation and then just uh, kind of the last bit of it. My wife and I put the kids on a plane and uh, drove to Tahoe and saw fish for a couple of nights. And then we drove, we flew home and uh, got home. Our flight was about two hours delayed, which in the grand scheme of things is no big deal. But got home about 2 a.m. on Thursday night, so Friday morning. And then I had uh, an 8 p.m. Tommy show on Friday and a midnight Rocky Horror show in the same theater on Friday. And, and, uh, and jet lag. Yeah, although I just I, up until yesterday, Sunday morning, I stayed on Pacific time, which was perfect for me because Saturday I had 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. Tommy's and then another midnight Rocky. And then yesterday I had a 2 p.m. Tommy. So uh, being on Pacific time in this case was um, was a good thing. Uh, you know, it just it, it worked out because the, the Rockies were like 9 p.m. shows for me. So that was I've good. done that a couple of times where like I had a business trip. And then I literally walked off a plane and went to a gig and, mm. and, and you kind of feel like a rock star when you do it a couple of times, but it is definitely not the preferred way of, you know, getting, I, I really find that I enjoy the preparation time, getting my head ready for a gig and, you know, kind of thinking through the set list and, yeah. and just you know, getting loosened up and, you know, all these types of things. I actually like that little ritual. Do you, do you have much of a ritual? Um, I do. Well, I mean, it depends. Like for a theater gig, it's different than it would be for just like a, a rock gig. You know, for a rock gig, I like to think about the set list, like you said, and and kind of craft things and get my head into it that way. For a theater gig, it's a little different because, you know, you're playing the same show, ostensibly playing the same show over and over and over again. So yeah. you have tech week where you really sort of immerse yourself in it and play the show you know, five times in a row or something like that. Um, but I had not done that. Right. I mean, I did tech week and then I left for two weeks. So I, and I went and played one last Tommy show before I left. And then less than 24 hours later was on an airplane. And then of course, as I just explained, you know, less than 24 hours after I got off the plane, I was playing <laughs> it again, but you know, it had been two weeks and it, it wasn't just two weeks of sitting around doing nothing. We, you know, we were traveling and lots of experiences and, you know, lots of sensory input to the brain. So my plan, and this is what I did was on the plane home, I opened up, I had my iPad, which is what I read my music from anyway. And I just played the, you know, the Broadway soundtrack. Uh, for it and just read through. And our, I mean, our parts are a little different than, than Broadway. We've changed some of the arrangements or whatever, just to fit some blocking and staging. But, um, but you know, it, it was great to get my head back into it so that on Friday, while I was playing the show, wasn't the first time that I was seeing this music in that way in, you know, in two weeks. And there were some moments where it was like, Oh, this, the, the, the like, we don't do it this way. It's like, oh, no, 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 we do. Like, it's normal. It's okay. You know, so that when that came up on Friday while I was playing, it was like, yep, okay, I've seen this recently. It's all good. Everything's fine. Like, no surprises. It's all good. Um, but yeah, because the band, the rest of the band had been playing it, uh, we changed guitar players or we changed one of the guitar players a, a weekend before I came back. But other than that, the rest of the band had been playing it, you know, for two weeks. So during tech week, I made sure that when I left, I was the one that knew the show way better than anyone else in the band. Smart. Because I knew they were going to catch up. <laughs> you know, they had 10 performances or something. So, That's a very Dave thing to do, though, man, to just like, you know, project two weeks ahead and solve that problem. That's that's uh, that's my buddy, Dave. That's uh, well, right, because I, I don't want to be the one holding the band behind, you know, and I knew that there would be some bits and pieces of it where it was going to be like, OK, you know, sorry, guys, you know, uh, but and and there was they changed one song, one song, Tommy's Holiday Camp. Um, it 
there's a reason Keith Moon did not play drums on that song, and it's not just because he sang it. Um, it it's because it doesn't, it shouldn't have drums. And, um, but it does, they added them for the Broadway thing. And it's just been like, it's a, it's been a struggle all the way through and it's still like, it's, I don't know. It's just not, it's weird. So, mm. but anyway, it's fine. You know, it, I don't know that it would be any different. I mean, it's not any different now than it, than it was on Friday. So I don't know, but, but otherwise it, the shows actually went really well. Uh, we're good. Yeah. 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 For the most part, it was, um, Friday was pretty good. Um, Saturday afternoon, I was, I had changed out some drum heads and was kind of fighting with, you know, sound and stuff a little bit. Um, and it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't that great. I was sort of distracted by that. Saturday night was fantastic. And then Sunday afternoon, you know, it's really interesting, man. You play a gig and, you know, you focus on the, the, the little things, right? They, 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 the way I think about Tommy, it especially from a drummer standpoint, not to discount what anybody else is doing, but certainly for me, th there are a lot of parts that require a lot of very specific and crazy dexterity for me, right? I mean, some of these fills and stuff, and it's just constant. You, you know, mm -hmm. some of these songs, you just you, basically you're playing a drum solo for the whole song, and right. and it's got to be there, and the, the hits have to be there so that it makes sense with what's happening on stage, and you know all of that. And um, and Saturday it just like flowed right out of me. It was like, oh, this is great. And even <laughs> even Friday, you know, and even the the Saturday afternoon show like where I was a little distracted by the, the drum tuning and stuff, but um, it, it went pretty well on Sunday, man. Like every, it's uh, the way I was thinking about it is sometimes you play the show and sometimes the show, the plays show you. plays you. Yeah. And, and that's how Sunday felt to me, y you know, it's just like, God, nothing I, like, it's just not coming out of me. I've got to like force it and then forget about the last song and just worry about the next one and reset, reset, reset. You know, yeah. one of these is going to be good. One of these is going to be good. I'm going to end a song and, and feel okay about it. You know, and that was kind of the, the thing I was telling myself all the way through the thing. And there's no stops, right? It's a rock opera. So there's very little, you know, very few moments where I could even get a drink of water, let alone, you know, like decompress or anything. And yep. uh, we got to the end of the show and I turned to the music director, this guy, Julius, and, and said, he was like, that was pretty good. I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, and he's like, no, he's like, I thought we played it really well. It's like, that's interesting. Okay, cool. You know, and, and I just told him, you, you know, when you're talking amongst bandmates or whatever, you just, you know, you're honest about it. And then I go backstage and the cast was all like, man, you killed it today. You were hitting all those little things. And uh, I was like, huh, that's hmm. interesting. You know, and then I started getting texts from friends that had been in, at the show. It's a pretty big house. So I, I don't always know everybody that's, you know, I, I don't always see everyone that's there. And so I started getting texts like, hey, we were at the show today. I realized you were playing drums. That was amazing. It's like, huh, huh, huh. Okay. You know what? Cool. That's great. Awesome. I've Thanks. come to the conclusion, Dave, that your brain is not your friend. I no. Mean, I, I, when it comes it's to playing music, we, we were having a discussion because we, we've had a couple of good shows lately. And uh, but there's a couple of, you know, things that go wrong. Right? Yes, Every, of course. Everybody has. I think. All right. So someone asked me, did you come in late on that? You know, for because you didn't hear because, you know, what they were asking me, you know, because I came in late on a verse. Right. Sure. And the deal is this. Once you go to your brain, you're dead. Because if in my head, I was like, okay, I know I have a problem with this verse and it's either this or this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what rule the universe takes over, but when you're presented with A and B, you, you always, always choose, choose wrong. wrong. Yes. Always. <laughs> always. It's like, you know, you it's the same thing. You don't the odds working in your favor. It doesn't no, occasionally it's, go the right way. It's not 50-50, right? It's, if, you, if you're going to go plug in a USB cable, you will get it wrong the first time. Absolutely. It's the same thing. Yeah. There's a, yeah. That, that, and that's beyond Murphy's law stuff. I mean, this is, this is, there's a new law. I'm going to call it Hamilton's law, right? Okay. <laughs> Once you go to the brain, you're dead. That's pretty much the, the premise of Hamilton's law. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing how once you have to think so many bad things happen. I mean, once you have to think, you're often letting the thing that you have to do in the moment slide for a second while you're thinking. Correct. Very hard for the human brain to do two things well at once. 
And then you're stuck with this phenomenon where if you cho- if you have two choices, you're going to choose wrong. God forbid you have more than two choices because then you're really messed up. Yeah. Well, at least then you know you're going to be wrong, right? When, uh, you can you believe with two choices that the odds are 50-50. <laughs> well, that's true. You're sitting there and you're thinking, you know what? I'm just going to choose one because the odds will probably work out a couple of times. And it never does. And you never <laughs> learn that lesson either. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is like, you, you know, like, like uh, my favorite quote. Perhaps my favorite quote of all time, but certainly my favorite musical quote is the the phrase that, you know, Jaco Pastorius said to a very young Peter Erskine when he joined Weather Report. And he said, don't think so much, man, just concentrate. And it's like, that's it. That's you just got to like get your head into it so that your head is out of it. Yep. And and actually, relative to that, one great lesson I've learned playing with the guys in the house rockers, again, You know, all good players, very good players, you know, half of them full time, you know, sure. And professional musicians, you know, I I would have um, I would often if I was like breaking a song down and rapping with the audience in between in invariably, I would not come in on one when I needed to do something. I would lose count, lose feel. Yeah. And um, and learning to trust the feel in order to get instead of just guessing or or worse, just kind of like bulldozing your way through something, right? Yeah. You know, learning to actually that that's a big part about playing music, playing in a band is having developed that intuitive sense to get you, you know, in the place where everybody else is. And with time and, you know, you know, with counts and, you know, like long passages, feeling where a one is, feeling where multiples of four are, you know, or, or a 16 bar solo or something yeah. like that. You know, there's a certain amount of, uh, uh, nobody's counting 32 bar solos, right? Nobody's counting it. They're kind of feeling where it is in, you in feel sets each of four. four right. They, exactly. Yep. And that's actually, a, you know, a really was a really valuable advice you, that doesn't dawn on you to trust the feel, um, often. And, but if you try and count it, you will get lost. I mean, you just will get lost. So, so learning how to, how to find the feel and hopefully you've got a good drummer who gives you a tip every once in a while and, sure. and, and makes the one pop for you every once in a while. Right. Yep. And, uh, so, you know, th- those types of th- things have been really variable. But once you get in your head, man, it is it is lights out. So here's the thing, right? Because with theater, trust, I mean, I'd certainly trust my my gut and my ability to feel four bar phrases, you know, just harmonically. You can hear the chord changes and it's like it's confirmation that, yep, four bars have gone by and, and, and you know, here's how this is going to go. But with theater, it's often... If you if you rely on that, you will get screwed because sometimes they intentionally either for staging or lines or whatever, you know, you're serving a purpose that often goes beyond just what the song is there to do. Right. So, you know, you'll have seven bar phrases and heaven forbid you start you stop looking at the music and just start feeling it. You can find yourself in a really bad spot. Now, combine that for Tommy with the fact that, you know, not only are these rock songs, but they are rock songs that I know and have known for a long time. And there are moments in the show where I catch myself not even reading the music, just playing the song. And most of the time, it's like like 99% of this show, that's totally okay to do. But the fact that I'm like in that theater mode and I catch myself doing that. It's like, oh, these are dangerous dice you're rolling here, Dave. You know, like it's cool For to sure. just play the song, but that can, you know, because I've trained myself to do exactly what you're talking about. You know, you just trust your gut, you feel the solo and you know when the turnaround is and all of that stuff. But sometimes the rules don't apply because a different rule has been specifically, mm-hmm. you know, there's the exception, right? For a reason. For a reason. Yeah. And you're not like, I'm not necessarily paying attention to what's happening on stage or anything. So it's not like, oh yeah, I see that this person has moved. And so we drop that beat and do this thing or what, you know, whatever. So, but that has been happening a lot with Tommy, um, you know, especially as this weekend progressed where it was like, oh yeah, okay, we're playing pinball wizard. I play this song all the time. Well, (laughs) yeah, but you know, the thing is if I add an extra four bar, like if we're playing pinball wizard with fling or any song and I add four bars before the verse starts, no problem. Like the whole band just catches up. Like they hear you start singing and, and it's like, okay, that's where the one is, you know, we're good. 
Uh, that's not necessarily how it goes in theater. If somebody misses the first line of the verse, you have to resume singing on the second. It, you know, it's just how it is. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's been um, it's been fun. But yeah, you're right. You got to get out of your head. It, it's out so head. weird. And and then there's that whole thing where you know I um I was thinking about this yesterday because I got this text from some friends, you know, that were like, oh yeah, you know, we were there and man, you were playing your ass off. Like that was great. It was really, you know, kind of a highlight of the show for us. And my initial response is to just be totally honest. Like I am here, right. Where it's like, well, yeah, that's cool. But you know, I just couldn't get out of my head and like that whole thing. And that's not, and there's no benefit in telling those people that. I mean, if they're listening here, you know, hi, Renee and Larry, uh, that's great, you know, and it's fine. But this is a different venue, right? This is this is where we dissect these things. It's what we do on this show. Yeah. But but when somebody comes up to you after a gig and and tells you how great they thought it was, you you kind of you kind of have to go with them on it. And and I mean, you don't have to agree and say, yeah, I was amazing. Right. You know, but you can say, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's a fun show to do. Right. I mean, you can just keep it positive without. Oh, dilu absolutely. Diluting their experience with your perhaps misperception of how things possibly came across to somebody. Else. Well, you know, that dissecting thing is a mixed bag of stuff. So, you know, remember, there's so many different perspectives. So. People are listening for different things and people are feeling different things when, yep. when a performance is happening. And there's, you know, one thing can hit them two minutes ago and they're still high and buzzing on it right over the point where you have muffed something up and, totally. and you can't discount that. But, you know, and I, you know, like, I, I don't know. Do you, do you go home and talk about your gigs? Like, I'm sure your, your wife asks you, how was the gig tonight? Right. Yeah, we, we do. You do go to a lot of detail? Yeah, it, with both with her and I mean my you know my daughter's in theater, she's a theater person and she also a drummer. So, we can get pretty de like sometimes those dissections can get pretty detailed. Yeah, yeah, we do. But and I do the same thing. I'll, I'll ask Terry how 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 did I sound tonight? How do we sound tonight? And and the funny thing is is that I, I often get feedback. You guys are too hard on yourself. Like you know, the the thing that you're stressing about, and you get it. You want to be good. You want to be great. You know, yeah. you want to play as well as you can. You want you want to feel the satisfaction of of having given a flawless, meaningful performance. You want other musicians to you know admire that. You want to move people who are listening to you. I mean, there's there's all sorts of reasons that we're striving to always get better and be as good as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, but that beating your elf, you know, that dissection thing. Now you're, you always say that, you know, there's a place to dissect it. And you actually, I don't ever hear you get, I hear you more like methodical in, in your, you know, identify, you know, assign responsibility, agree, everybody's going to fix their thing and move on. That, that, that's kind of how I get it from you. you you're, usually. You're, <laughs> I've, I've never seen the other side of it with you. So the other side, it's interesting. You mentioned it because as soon as we started this discussion, it just came like full force. The The Thursday night show that I did right before we got on the plane, the family decided it at the relative last minute, like a couple days before they were like, we're going to go, you know, we, we want to see this show before we go away so that, you know, we can talk about it and your heads in it and all that stuff, which is, we, you know, we've, we've not done that kind of thing before. And it's really sort of weird. So they were like, oh, we're going to go, you know, it's the night before vacation. We're all finished packing. It's great. I'm like, cool. Great. And that night was the first night uh, we had some guitar player problems. I, Tommy in general is cursed. Uh, like, it's just sort of a known thing that, that this blind, deaf and dumb. Yeah. But the whole Broadway, you know, stage production of it is just cursed in many ways. And, and largely because it's a really intricate, difficult show to do. And you're compressing a lot into basically 90 minutes. You know, the show's really short. Even yeah. within intermission, it's like less than two hours and people are leaving the theater. So, you know, and there's a lot going on. And and the guys that directed this one, uh, they, they call themselves the Mad Men of Oopsie Daisy Inc. And they're just crazy people. They're the ones that do Madhouse. And they they get to direct essentially one show a year. This, actually, this one, they're actually doing two main stage shows. But, uh, you know, they, they increase the difficulty level exponentially and it's awesome but it you know creates problems and then we had guitar player issues like first day of rehearsal our guitar one guy quit and then we you know tried to rejuggle things and finally we got this guy that had done it with with the directors like 10 years ago and his like literally the first time he was playing it with uh with us in and or at all in 10 years was th that night that thursday night and uh 
And so it was a little, you know, it was going to be a little sketchy or whatever and, and a little rough. And, uh, I got, you know, I finished the show. Thank goodness. I didn't look at my phone at intermission and I finished the show and I'm getting all these texts, like, you know, from Lisa and and the kids, mm. like th- this is like all of their nitpicks about the show. And it's like, oh man, like, I don't need, like, I'm this not is not, this. I'm not yeah. ready for this. Yeah. And so I got home and I was pissed. I'm like, I'm sorry you hated the show. They're like, why do you think we hated it? I'm like, well, you know, I got like 15 texts from you complaining about all, all this stuff. But and I wouldn't be just like them. I, I would assume you want this stuff, that you thrive I, on processing this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I know. And it was just the wrong time for me, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was like, what the hell, you know. And and it turns out they really liked it. They just had some very, you know, specific things that really bothered them about it. And they shared those things. Kind of thinking that the same things would have bothered me about it, you know, like, oh, the guitar player didn't come in here or whatever, you know, like like those kinds of things, which I'm sure in the moment did bother me. But it was like, wow, you know, I like this is awful. So many people, including me, have put like so much effort into this thing. And now I find out, you know, basically on opening night that it's terrible. Uh, And it wasn't terrible. It was just, you know, right. It was and they really liked it. Um, they, they were just had some specific nitpicks and they came Saturday night, uh, again and loved every minute of it. it you know, they're like, wow, the band's gotten better. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, they've been playing for three weeks. <laughs> so we had, uh, I'll echo that. So yeah. we've, um, you know, we've had a lot, we have a lot of new material and we, uh, went, we actually had a midsummer rehearsal. We, the rehearsal was ostensibly because we were preparing a couple special songs for a special wedding that we played this week, but we used it as an opportunity to, to, to polish a couple of things up. And we went to the rehearsal and, um, I had said, Hey, if anybody wants to polish anything, as long as we're getting together, you know, bring your list. So, so the first couple of things in the list were directed towards one person. And the person was like, is this a, is this a me list? <laughs> like, is that is this an intervention? That, yeah. And, and yeah. And actually, you know, the, the, here's the thing. That process of dissecting, and I'll, I'll, I'll bounce this back in, in a leader-led band, it's the leader's responsibility, and in a de- democratic environment, I think it's really important for the whole band to recognize the spooning out of, con- even if it's constructive criticism meant in the most awesome way, like you're saying right here, there's a place and time where people can be receptive to hearing that criticism, right? Even constructive, you know, wh- whatever it may be there's a way to do it and you have to kind of feel right. Yeah. We have a guy, we have a guy in our group who's just dealing with some personal stuff right now. The receptors are not up. It just won't be a productive conversation. Yep. And, and there's some people in the band that like, you know, yes, you know, <laughs> this like self-flagellation, give it all, you know, let it rain on me. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Right. Dude, right. Hurt me, man. And, and, uh, but I think you kind of have to weigh those things because it can't, it, and the counterpoint to it is even after a gig where you think was just okay, when you get a couple of lit up faces coming in and you've done your job and, and you know, you did reach a couple of people with the music you're playing, you got to remember that in the big sense, you know, it's good to strive. It's good to always want to perfect your craft. But at the end of the day, don't be blind that you've gotten good enough at your craft that even with a couple of dings, you're still achieving that goal of making people happy with your right. music. And that's it. And, and there's yeah. a balance, you know, that doesn't mean you get sloppy and you allow yourself to be sloppy, but, um, but it does mean you got to kind of keep your you got to elevate above the situation and look down on the situation as much as you can to understand the dings were opportunities to get better in the big sense. Did you do what you could? What you, did you do your job? And next time, can you go out and even do it better? And yeah. that, that's kind of the whole process that we're after show after show after show. That's the process. Yeah. To, to your point about, you know. Judiciously or carefully delivering those, you know, those nitpicks or feedback, criticism, whatever you want to call it, um, where to me, where you have to, and I say this about myself delivering it to others, but clearly it's also true about it coming back to me is there's an amount that is tolerable for any given person in any scenario. And that amount changes, right? You know, like you said, you've got a guy that's going through some personal stuff. So his list, his number is lower, right? Maybe he can take zero pieces of criticism. You know, maybe he can take two, whereas normally he might be able to take 10 and, and you've got to prioritize. And, and again, like you said, you know, carefully like dish them out, but also space them out 
And um, because, you know, and like with my family, you know, there were like 15 things that they had, you know, found. It's just like if it were two or three, I might have been OK. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a difference, right? There's a there's there's a line somewhere in there. And wherever it was for me, it was like, man. Now, remember, in the theater world, though, there's a construct for this, right? The construct of show notes. And it's just totally. part of, right? So, yes. And it's expected. And, you know, the thing is, we have this thing. We're performing for two weeks. And we really want to get it to as perfect as we can because it's going to go away at the end of those two weeks. Yep, and that's so it. the director takes his notes, hands them out. It's not a personal, you know, uh, affectation. It's, it's literally, this is my method. We have two weeks to continue to refine and process and then it's done. And maybe that's the thing is that it's such a finite amount of time often when you're doing a show yeah. that, you know, especially a semi-professional, like a Broadway show where it's going on and on. I don't know if they still do show notes, you know, six months into a run. I I bet that they do. But it's also a, a bit of the vibe of your band, I think. I mean, if, yeah. if your band is like, we are committed to dissecting every show. Everybody in? Yes, we're all on the same page. Yes. All right. Here's a method we're going to dissect a show. So I guess it's a little bit about. You know, this goes back to if you're a semi-professional band and the guys have the stress of family and day jobs and the band is not their end all. You know, if that's the vibe of your band, then you have to kind of put in these constructs where you're respecting people's kind of headspace before you, you know, dole out the criticisms uh, or, or constructive criticisms. Right. Yep. So. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, what is what is your band's agreed upon preferred and constructive and productive method? for communicating things. Is it a leader led band? Is it a democracy democracy? You know, how does it happen? Do you, do you agree to do show notes after every show? After, right. Like, right. Yeah. You know, what's the expectation that, that everyone has coming into it? Well, I mean, we had this conversation, like, I feel like it was like, I don't know, two years ago, maybe we, um, we talked about how fish had adopted a new thing at that point, which was their no analysis rule. Right now they wouldn't have gotten to where they were, with a no analysis rule. In fact, they in the were beginning a hundred percent, you know, it was 180 degrees different from that. They nitpicked and analyzed things that didn't even happen. Right. You know, that could have happened. And how would we deal with it? Like that was their whole thing. And that's why they can do what they do. But, right. but then they got to a point where it was like, dude, enough's enough. Like we got to just draw the line. We're not going to, we've been doing this 30 years. We're not going to change, you know, fundamentally as musicians, if we spend 20 minutes hating the, the set that we just did, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Yeah. And also, you know, they're playing fairly, you know, they're playing their library, right? And Correct. so yeah. the, the fundamental premise that everybody knows what they did wrong when they did something wrong is, you know, that, that probably carries the day quite a bit. It's a fair I deal. Mean, yep. Yeah. We had kind of an interesting thing. Um we started a song a different way. So we playing um, dance to the music. Yeah. Sly and the family stone. And that usually just starts right in. Bum, 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 bum. You know, it just yeah. starts with the horn. Right. Yeah. But um, we used it as an opener and um, you know, rather than do that, we had the drummer start the beat. Of course. And then I kind of welcomed the audience and, you know, then counted in the horns. And, and so we did that on, on night one, the very next night we're playing the song and, um, uh, I didn't, I didn't tell everybody again that that's what we were going to do. And so one guy just started on the count of the drums and, and, sure. you know, and so my, it was my assumption that it wasn't an obvious, we did it last night this way, you know, that, and that worked really well. It, it's going to happen this way again. Now, you know, that was a, that was a look at each other on stage and a knowing nod, you know, this is what transpired. Yeah. Note to me, you know, don't take anything for granted. Sure. Right. Of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. And note to him, assume, you know, assume if something happens one way once, you know, Paul will go with it until he changes it. Right. That, that type of thing. It, yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's the evolution of, of yeah. Learning how to read each other's minds Unspoken. on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I saw fish screw something up. I mean, it was the first night of their tour. They opened their tour in Tahoe and um, they, they played this song, the song called slave to the traffic light that, I mean, has been in their catalog for, you know, 35 years. Right. I mean, it's, it's one of their oldest tunes. They've been playing it forever. And the, the intro kind of, you know, there's this instrumental intro and then the band all sings and, uh, the drummer, about halfway through the instrumental intro, the drummer played a fill that felt very final, you know, like, oh, we're changing sections here, you know, and uh, the guitar player went with it 
And like, I, I, maybe they hadn't rehearsed this song. Maybe it had been, you know, six or eight months since they'd played the tune or whatever. And he heard this fill and he just went up to the mic and, you know, changed chords and started singing. And the band immediately, you know, caught right up with him and, and, and went with it. And they just skipped that section of the tune. But it was very obviously like this thing of, of, okay, you know, we, we haven't talked about this and we haven't thought about this together as collectively in a while. And now, oh, you know, here we are, we made a mistake, but here we go. You know, and we just like, that was it. But if they had played the song three nights before and the drummer played that fill, they never would have jumped. You know, mm. it was one of those like, uh oh, we haven't done this in a while. We don't know how to read each other's minds again yet. You know, <laughs> how do we do this? And uh, and it just, you know, it was it was one of those moments. But it it's it happens. Right. It, it happens it, it, to everybody. It happens to everybody. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's where things get get interesting. Right. Is when you have one of those moments and you're like, crap, we like we we would all have assumed walking on stage that we've been playing together for X number of months, years, whatever. And we will not have this type of confusion. And yet there you go. You know, it doesn't matter that, like you said, you played the night before you, you, you know, you're already reading each other's minds. Nope. Not a hundred percent of the time. Nope. <laughs> it's the fun, the fun and the, um, the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want to tell you about uh, Simon and I played a special event yesterday, and um, uh, the task was to play as much 90s music as we can. So we've talked about 90s music on the show. Yeah. I just want to go through the set list with you. It was acoustic. It was two guys. And I got to say, I am having a really great time doing these acoustic shows with Simon's because they're they're you know obviously different than when I do a solo show, yeah. solo acoustic. They're different than the format and the style of music that the that my trio does, you know, which is mostly harmony music. You know, a lot more music from kind of like early 70s singer songwriter era type stuff. Sure. I um, mean, obviously a lot different from the house rockers, but Simon and I have the benefit of our mind milled of house rocker experiences lends itself well to this duo thing. So totally. oh, we yeah. trade solos in this and we open some stuff up and, you know, we goof around a little bit and it's been really, really fun. So, you know, it's kind of nice for me, you know, in terms of if I get a call I and actually it's making me rethink I'd in many of the venues that I'm playing solo stuff, I'd rather do the duo stuff and then really be picky and choosy about where I do the solo stuff, pay all things equal pay and, you know, hassle yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, it's kind of fun. You know, I spent a lot of time this year getting solo gigs and that's good. And I, I still love what it does for helping me refine my craft as a singer and a guitar player and a performer. Sure. But, but, uh, but I'm best at doing that, in my opinion, when I can play to a crowd that's listening to me, like like playing in the back of a restaurant ain't my thing. And um, and I don't do that as well. And so, you know, Simon and I have taken a couple of these gigs, which are kind of like, you know, they're largely background music or, you know, that type of thing. But you and have each play other whatever to play off of. Yeah, exactly. And it's really been stimulating. Plus, I just like him so much as a person. It's just really fun for me to kind of goof around with him and just do some interesting things. And sure. we have similar tastes in music. I mean, I go out a little bit one way and he goes out a little bit another way. But the the circles overlap largely. But anyway, I want to talk to you about this 90s gig and just see how many of you these played. I'll tell you about some of them. OK, so. Uh, one of the first songs I've ever played with him that he's been doing for years, acoustic is high and dry by Radiohead. Oh, really yeah. fun song. Great acoustic song, just jangles and really, that's really a, cool. That's a great song to do, especially when you're not trying to keep a crowd's attention, because that's one of those that halfway through the song, people are like, holy crap, they're playing high and dry. Right. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like as a, turns head. it turns heads, but if you're in the midst of, uh, you know, a rock and set that will definitely also turn heads, but in a different direction. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, that's kind of the interesting thing. So this gig we played last night was for a winery's um, 25th anniversary. And largely the patrons were a little older. The theme of the whole party was a 90s theme. So we were playing in the grunge garage, um, which was the patio. And um, sure. uh, I 
as we went through the, you know, the, the typical grunge stuff and 90s stuff and, you know, the audience was, I didn't get the sense that they were, that they really knew a lot of 90s music or really connecting to a lot of 90s. Music. So we, we spun a couple other things in there, but nonetheless, it was fun to kind of go through this 90s stuff. It was pretty angsty though, that, you know, the grunge stuff. So next song, also a Radiohead song, Fake Plastic Trees. You know that one? Yeah. We've played both of those Radiohead tunes in Fling. Russ is a, both Russ and Aaron are big Radiohead fans. So, so we've had cool. more Radiohead than, uh, represented than most bands i think but but right. yeah that's a fun one i like that one yeah that's good and we played creep of course which is kind of a you know a staple for 90s set list right absolutely yep yep interstate love song stone temple pilots okay i love love playing that one that one works really well acoustic because you can really dig, does. dig in a little bit but it's still like the melodies there and the chord structure is there that that really just support it's just a good song even though you kind of know it is this heavy driving groove thing. Yep. That was the one, the one song that was the most like a, like an MTV unplugged experience. Like you can just play the song acoustically and it still pops out and really, you know, this chord changes are so nice in that song. So that was, that so was nice. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, then we also played creep by stone temple pilots. Oh, I've never played that one. Oh, like, kind cool. of a ballad, pretty slow and moody. Yeah. Um, on the list, but we didn't get to last night was Jeremy by Pearl jam by Pearl jam. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Even flow by Pearl Jam. Fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also works very well. Unplugged. Um, elderly woman behind the counter, which is basically a folk song that worked very well. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite song that we played that Simon brought in was 1979 by the Smashing Pumpkins. Really, really fun song to play unplugged. Oh, interesting. I've never played. I, yeah. Huh. Oh, that's pretty good, man. Oh, yep, yeah. Good. I like that. Uh, Say It Ain't So by Weezer was on the list, but we didn't get to it. That's a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. All the Weezer stuff is fun. Uh, Weezer's fun. Yeah, those guys yep. know how to write songs for sure. Yep. Um, then the ones that I did, Champagne Supernova was fun. So, okay, I have a thing about that song, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> You have many opinions about Oasis, as I recall. Oh, no, I love Oasis. They, I they, know you they, Great band. Um, that song, I've tried it acoustic many times and really only had it work once. It, it You know, that song is... It's a great progression, right? And when it starts, you're, you think, oh, man, this song would work great acoustic. And then what I find is it just it just drags on a little bit. It doesn't the the, the energy. Well, it's pretty repetitive. Yeah. The energy of that song comes from, you know, the, the drums getting louder and the electric guitar taking that solo and really kind of, you know, stretching to to, to different levels. Whereas the song itself is just, I mean, it's a great progression as all Oasis songs are, but the vocal, yeah. the vocal melody isn't the thing that takes it there. Right. It. Um, so I see this. So remember I am, I am maniacal about unplugged, un, uncovering unplugged versions of, of good rock songs. Sure. So, you know, I yep. spent an unusual amount of time on YouTube, you know, going through, um, going through bootleg archives, all this type of stuff. So there are a couple of acoustic formats of, of champagne supernova, both, you know, creative people on YouTube making it up themselves. And there actually are a couple of Gallagher brother yeah. you know, versions of it on YouTube. So I had no problem with it. It flowed really nice. Interesting. You know, it's That's a good. The structure. Of the song has a nice bridge has a, you know, really memorable chorus. So I had no problems with it. It worked out pretty well. That's good. Yeah. I played the last time I'd given up on it acoustic and, and somebody, this, this woman requested Oasis at a recent monkey fist gig. And we played Wonderwall or, or maybe Don't Look Back in Anger or something. And um, both of which are great. Don't Look Back yep. in Anger is one of the best songs ever written, I think. But uh, so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, and then we finished it and she's like, well, no, that's not the Oasis song I wanted. It's like, why do you like, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> like, like, we're up here entertaining and you're like treating us like a jukebox. And she's like, I really wanted Champagne Supernova. And it's like, you know what? That's fine. Okay, cool. We'll do it. And it worked out really well. So I, what do I know? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, so we did Wonderwall. I did the Ryan Adams version of Wonderwall because it's sure. such a nice finger picking song. Yep. And don't look back in anger. You're right. It just goes great. And actually, that's one where Simon, you know, uh, having two guitars. So I've done it solo and it always goes over well. But Simon did, you know, a combination of. He, he capos it way up high oh. and he gets a little bit of a mandolin sound to it. And then he plays like these, the, you know, the, um, these walk down riffs that I think on the original are actually a string riff that, you yeah. know, that, 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 I know that, what you're talking about though. Yeah. Yep. And so he just makes it sound huge. And so that, that's been really fun. So we, we did both of those. That's great. Um, uh, didn't make the list this time was times like these by the Foo Fighters. 
That's a that one actually works acoustic. Yeah, that's pretty. Well, there good. is there's a very well known version that Grohl recorded of of an acoustic. Yep. Also on the list, but we didn't get to it last night. But we're playing tonight, so we'll do them. Oh, is nice. Ants marching and uh, crash into me. Two Dave Matthews songs. I like Ants live uh, as an acoustic thing. We do that a lot in Monkey Fist, and that works really well. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Uh, uh, Counting Crows, Long December. Counting oh, Crows, yeah. Have You Seen Me Lately? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my contribution to the Radiohead canon was Karma Police. That's another one that we've played in Fling. I, li- I actually really like that song. I, we haven't played it in a long time. I miss playing that tune. Yeah, that's that, a good one. To me, you know, again, Radiohead songs kind of have that feel, that kind of dark, heavy feel where yeah. you know goes goes to unusual intervals and major and minor you know mixes them up and um that one is a very effective song i mean it just communicates the story of the song really really well yeah yeah it, it's tough singing tom york stuff he's he's got such a such a well, huge to range that yeah yep uh we did an acoustic version of smells like teen spirit worked fine you can really almost do anything to, that is that might be the honky tonk woman of the 90s <laughs> you can really hack away on that song and people just love screaming along with it so they it's, do. A, it's a pretty good one yeah and you know all those nirvana songs uh, not all of them, but many, most perhaps of them work really well acoustically. Like they were, they were written to be much lighter songs than, than they turned out to be. And, and a lot of that was Cobain not wanting to be compared to the Beatles. Uh, so he thought, okay, if we make them heavy, then nobody's going to, you know, say that these are Beatles songs that we, you know, that we wrote. I've never heard that before. Where yeah. did you hear that? Um, I'm trying to think I, it, it was, <sighs> Maybe it was one of those behind the, 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 the like album dissection. I can't think, I can't remember the name of the, 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 the show that's on, on, I don't know if it's VH1 or whatever, where they, they take an album and dissect it with, you know, with the original Got engineer it. and, and yeah. whatever band members are still around. And uh, yeah, I remember the classic engineer, tracks or something, classic that, tracks that, or classic yeah. albums or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was like, oh, that actually makes sense. And they played some, you know, acoustic versions of, of songs off of Nevermind. It was like, oh yeah, these actually, I mean, I can see where, where Cobain actually would have gotten that. Cause with all the harmonies and everything, those are, you know, yeah. very Beatle inspired. Some of oh, those chords. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Black Hole Sun prepared, but didn't play. Now here's the thing about Black Hole Sun. Um, very, very fun. Um, obviously quintessential acoustic song. Very, very fun song to play. Yeah. But you know, when Cornell does Cornell and at the end when he's repeating that chorus and he's up singing a high A and a high G, yeah. you know, here's the deal. I've heard a lot of people try that song and Cornell sings those and he has the power, but he's not, he's not yelling. He's singing. Right. And when a lot of people sing that song, cause it's high for most male ranges. They're, they're yelling those. And I think it kind of messes up the song. So that I, I, I change the melody a little bit or I mm-hmm. sing it down, you know, something because you, you know, if you're not Cornell and you can't be Cornell, don't be Cornell. Don't be Cornell. I think you, yep. Cause I think you can actually ruin what you can, most people can do a good job with a, you know, a really workmanlike job with 90% of that song until it gets to that ending refrain. And again, if you can do it all the more power to you, but if not, that's a really good example, especially for cover band musicians. It's a really good example of a song. Like, be, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You, if you can, if you can augment that, and especially solo, where you can create whatever mood you want with that song. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, you can find alternates. You can sing a G and an F sharp. You know, you, you can you can change it slightly, um, and find a way that works for you because it's a really effective song. I mean, just the the it, it's a drop D tuning, and you know the progression is really interesting, and the, and the guitar rings really well when you play it acoustically, and you know it, it's a really great song for a solo person to do. Um, that's interesting. Again, yeah. I, I, sometimes changing the song is, is the best way to stay true to it. Right. I mean, change and, and changing the melody or changing the, you know, whatever. Well, it's a lot better than hacking it. Right. It's, it's Right. Right. If you're not the person that sang it or, or wrote it, you know, sometimes the, the best thing to do is to kind of adopt whatever they were able to do to sing it. And you do what you can do to sing it, and it it actually comes across better. Yeah, and that to me has actually been the, one of the great parts of the journey of doing these solo shows. Is yeah. actually, you know, there's some people who are blessed or or trained and are great singers and can accomplish whatever they want with their instrument, their vocal instrument. That's really cool. That's cool for those yeah. of us who are not that. You know, what are you going to do to go over? What are you yeah. going to do to commu- And you know, to me, it's all about that inhabiting the story of the song, and you know, really, you know 
imposing some kind of unique thing. That that's that's something that comes more naturally to me, you know, as the way that I I communicate through music. And so that I do that a lot, especially in the solo stuff. I mean, you know, if you can't be or you can't approximate and, you know, it's even harder for me because, you know, as a Springsteen fan, I can't approximate his tone, his, the power of his, you know, songs, you know, how he gets his high notes. Yeah. Right. You know, he kind of does this crazy thing, which to me sounds like he's pinching his vocal cords and just kind of like growling them out. It does. Yep. You know, in a head voice thing, which is technically aw- awful for your voice, you know, terrible for your vocal cords. Right. And I don't know if that's actually what he's doing. It certainly sounds what, like he's doing, but I can't do that. So I have to find my way around that stuff. And so uh, the way that I do that is, you know, I really try and emote the story and try and find, you know, interesting pauses, interesting places where you hold a note, you know, all these types of things to still kind of get the story told. And it is, that's my journey. You know, that's, you know, right. it's not always right. It's not always perfect. It's not always the most effective way. I'd like to think I'm never hurting the song by doing it, but I don't know if I'm ever you know, if I don't, if I miss, then it's a miss. Then not only have I not, you know, approximated the vibe of what made the song great for someone else in the first place, but I'm not adding anything to it. Yeah, by, right, you know, by right. Taking my sure. path, so. Yeah. And then just a couple more. I'm a big Matchbox 20 fan. So um, Push, Long Day, and Disease uh, oh. are Matchbox 21. So Interesting. So no 3 a.m. for you. Not this time. I, okay. I, would, I would do them all. I, I really like Rob Thomas. I like his songwriting. I yeah. like I'm I can, I can kind of get into his vocal range and, you know, there's a lot of stuff there for me. So, um, it's, you know, it's really push interesting. Is, push is, push is one of those tunes that whenever I'm with, you know, with monkey fist and playing with Johnny and he says, Oh, let's play push. It's like, okay, that's fine. You know, but it, like, it's not the song I would pick. And halfway through the tune, I find myself loving it every yeah. time. But, but when it's like time to pick a song, it's like, ah, oh, it's a throwaway song. Like that's not, I don't know. Okay, fine. You know? And then it's great. Yeah. Yeah. You do any Counting Crows? Um, Mr. Jones. Yeah. 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 So again, uh, th- there is a phenomenal acoustic version of Mr. Jones. Yep. Fantastic, moody acoustic version. And, you know, that's that's the fun to me. So anyway, that was my 90s night. Very successful. Very fun. Learned a lot. Learned about Because I remember I, I I came on the show and I, and I dissed 90s music. Yeah, and I, that's it, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, th- I think the thing is what I don't understand is – whether people who grew up with nineties music, how important that music is to them, that they're taking it forward into their life in the way that I did seventies and eighties music and some, you know, Motown, some sixties music as sure. well. Yeah, yeah. So I, that's, that's something I don't know. And that could just be a generational and, thing. Or whatever and we it is. might not know that for a little while. Right. But yeah. I do find that when you play those nineties songs, like people are into it. Um, so they have a vibe for they sure. Have a vibe. They, what communicate we, emotion. We started playing something, you know, I'm a big bowling for soup fan. And, um, but I didn't think many other people were, and we started playing, uh, oh, what was it? It, was, it wasn't girl. All the bad guys. Want. I, no, I don't it, know that they're, they're kind of in that Weezer mode, power pop of the nineties. Is that total right? Total power pop. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like toilet humor, power pop. I mean, they're definitely very sophomoric in, in, both their antics on stage and their songwriting, but they're, they're extremely funny. Like, I'm, like I'm going on Spotify right now, looking up the genre of toilet humor, power pop. Is there, <laughs> there more to be found? I, if, if, if that <laughs> genre exists, they are at the top of the list, but, but you know, Jarrett Reddick is a stellar, like he could, he could do stand up comedy. In fact, I think he has done stand up comedy. He is, he understands timing. Their shows are works of art in terms of just like, you know, they'll, they'll stop in the middle of a song and he's already halfway through a story, you, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the timing and everything, it's just like really, really, he, he's just got a sense for it. And, and that's a huge part of the success of that band. The other part is the songs, but um, but he's also got a great voice, it's, which is sort of weird for that, that vibe of, of power pop. Like, like he's just got a stellar voice and their harmonies are always really good unless the bass player has laryngitis and then there's no harmonies, um, for one of the gigs I, I happened to catch. But, um, but yeah, we started playing, oh, it was 1985, which yes. Cause I know somebody's going to shake their fist. Um, you're right. That's not a song that Bowling for Soup wrote. It was written by the the songwriter in SR 71. And as soon as he wrote it, he thought, well, that's weird. I just wrote a Bowling for Soup song. So he called up Jared mm-hmm. Reddick and he gave him the tune. <laughs> um, 
And uh, and so I think they were the first. I think Bowling for Soup was the first ones to release it, but then SR seventy one did did put a version out. But we played that tune, and um, and there were my my wife and my daughter were there, and and they be, because of me are also uh, Bowling for Soup fans, so I knew they would know it. But my daughter had two of her friends with her, you know, senior high school senior girls at the time, and like they knew every word. I was like, that's really weird. And even mm. Sky, my daughter was surprised. She's like, why do you guys know this song? Like, I, I didn't think anybody knew this, this band. So that's another one of those that, that, um, you know, those guys had like that song and, and girl, all the bad guys want, um, definitely got some airplay, you know, for those guys. So sweet. Yeah. 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 So there you go. Fun stuff. Viva la 90s. Viva la 90s. Yeah, it's, it can be really fun music to play. There's harmony opportunities. The chord structure is fun. And and one thing I really like about 90s songs is a lot of them, certainly not all of them, but a lot of them, they're kind of like country songs where they sound pretty simple, but there are very specific like cuts and stops and turns and twists that make the songs interesting. They're, it's not like playing Sweet Home Alabama all the way through. Not that there's anything Agreed. wrong with that, but you know, there there's an actually... If you play Sweet Home Alabama the right way, there are stops and twists and turns Definitely. that they put into that song, too, that most people have just glossed over. And the same is true with Honky Tonk Woman and all those. But, but you know, those 90s songs, the, the, the craft of songwriting had had definitely come back around to popular music uh, in a way that allowed those sort of things to get, to you know, to get incorporated into tunes. And you can't hack your way through them. Like if somebody calls, you know, some 90s tune in a, a you know, at a jam session or, or heaven forbid in the middle of a gig, I'm always like, oh, okay. I know the song. I've heard it before, but I definitely don't know like which verse drops a bar and, and, you know, how that bridge jumps uh, the chorus and this sort of thing. So, yeah. Well, as we said in the beginning, you got to feel it. You got to feel it. Yeah. But some of those <laughs> tunes you don't feel right. I mean, some of those things, they were intentionally written so that it, it changed it, it to mess up cover bands to, to mess up. Co yeah. There you go. To mess up cover <laughs> bands. Writing songs to screw up future cover versions. There you go. Well, that does it for me, man. You got anything else to talk through? No, good to have you back. Glad you had a good trip. Yeah, fun, it's good to be fun back. Chat. Yeah, fun, fun. All right, folks. Well, you know where to find us, giggabpodcast.com. Uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com is the place to send us email. You can uh, find us on Facebook at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. What else do we got, Paul? Oh, well, we got to always be performing, man. Always. I got seven more shows this weekend, so there you go. Woo! Woo! 